Hi, I'm James Eid of the Eid Foundation. You can call me Jim. The Eid Foundation is dedicated to building communities through chess. And if you're part of a community, you're never alone. And if you play chess, you can be part of the community. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what country you're from. You can be part of the chess community if you want to play chess. So uh, today's topic is, well, this is the Eid Foundation sponsored chess files. And the answers are out there. And today's question is, what does chess philanthropy, philanthropy mean? And I, to answer that question, I've got two guests. And I want to bring them on now. The first is Al Lawrence. The second is Steve Doyle. And Al and Steve, you're part of a chess charity organization, are you not? It's the U.S. Chess Trust, you bet. I can see the banner, the uh, the picture in the background. That's very oh, do, impressive. Oh, do I have that up? I, oh, I was yes. uh, just incidental. Yeah, I keep that around. And so you, that's the that's the U.S. Chess Trust, and it's a five hundred one c three, and and you know, like all philanthropies, I think uh, our our mission really is to improve people's lives, and we're convinced that, as I think many of your viewers will agree, that uh, chess helps improve people's lives. And we focus on at-risk kids, disabled kids, veterans, and the elderly. That's our main focus. And we also have a, a, a big effort into supporting the most promising players uh, in the U.S. Uh, give you a, a quick taste of that, quick taste of that. Nine of the uh, invitees into this year's U.S. championship as well as last year's U.S. Championship, uh, were either U.S. Chess Trust Sanford Fellows or former U.S. Chess Trust uh, Sanford Fellows. So there's there's a lot of different branches to what we do. We are a charity. You can see our good work at www.uschesstrust.org. Uh, and I encourage your viewers to do that. Say again? At scrolling across the bottom of our screen. A excellent. Okay. And uh, you get a... Um, You'll get a number of articles on what we do and uh, and uh, why we think, as, as I think as many of you already know, um, the chest itself can, Im can improve uh, both social and intellectual skills and mental acuity of people of all ages, although primarily we have focused at the, uh, on at-risk kids. And, okay. and, and Steve, Steve is, our, is our president. I was just going to say, you're the managing director, and I was going to wonder why Steve Doyle was on. He's the president, you say. Yes, so sir. Steve, Steve, tell me a little bit about uh, the, the purpose of the trust from the president's point of view. Well, if you think about the Chess Trust, we were started in 1967. We're one of the oldest, uh, well, in chess, we're the oldest charity that exists in the United States. Uh, in terms of you know, other charities, one of the very first uh, charities in any sort of a sport that was created in the country. Uh, and, and, and we're very proud of that. Uh, and if you think about all the things that we've done since 1967, it's an impressive list. And, and as Al uh, very eloquently covered, our range and scope is wide. Uh, the lives that we've touched in, you know, in those uh, 50 years nearly or you know are just huge and, and and it's just great to be a part of this and it's it's such a vibrant part of the chess community nationwide uh, that, you know that it's an honor to be able to serve as president and we're so lucky to have Al as our managing director well, um, you know I, I, I want to say that there are a lot of good causes out there. Uh, there always are, particularly in this time of need, there are a lot of good causes. But I want to say uh, uh, when one does uh, contribute to the Chess Trust, um, you, you can rely on uh, a ratio that's pretty impressive. You know, something like 85 to 90 cents of every dollar actually goes into our programs. We don't, we, we don't have a full-time staff. Uh, we don't have uh, an office building. We don't even have an office. We we all work out of our homes um, and did so before the COVID. And and all of our trustees, in, in uh, of course, including Steve, uh, take no uh, reimbursement, re remuneration for their services. So it's it's one of the causes that you can rely on uh, to do what they say say we do. 
which is to support those things as, as much as we possibly can. Well, Al, I, you know, when I give to a charity, one of the first things I look at is the administrative costs because I want the dollars I give to go to the purpose I want them to serve. And what you know, I'm hearing from you say, what I'm hearing you say is that the trust trust has a very low ratio of administrative costs. Absolutely. So, so the bang for the buck is is really good when you're talking about the U.S. Chess Trust. And, and the money goes where we say it does. That's right. Right. So, um, Steve, you know, you could rely on individual donors, right? But is there any other way that you can get this funding? Because even though the trust go, does, the trustees of the trust do give to support these projects and individual donors do give, there must be another angle, uh, another way. For example, say I'm... Um, you know, I've got no dependents, I'm alone, and uh, I don't know, maybe I'm doing my estate planning, and maybe that's a way to give to the chest trust. Is is that ever been successful with, with your efforts? Not only it's been hugely successful, Jim, we have a number of very generous chess players uh, in the past that have left a bequest to the chest trust tens of thousands of dollars. In fact, my own will is set up uh, that my children will receive much of my estate, but I have left a number of charities a fairly significant portion of my estate. Uh, in the meantime, I get to use it. But yes. when I'm done with it, it passes along and it's going to help chess. Uh, and, you know, and that's a way, and that's a way for everybody to be able to do it. And at that point, all you're doing is leaving a great gift for the future. And, and you've already enjoyed uh, your assets, and now you're passing it along for somebody else to really experience the joy that you've had in chess. So uh, I encourage every chess player that hears this nationwide or even worldwide to always remember the U.S. Chess Trust in their estate. It's a great way to leave a legacy, and that's what it becomes. It becomes your legacy to thank uh, future generations uh, for what you enjoyed. Uh, today from your chess involvement. And, you know, I have always said, thank you, Steve, for that, because uh, I think that's an important message to get out there. Um, but I've always said that when you give the gift of chess, you give it to a kid for a lifetime. Because chess, as a kid, it's, it has educational value. Because if you gain confidence by playing chess, you think you're smart. We don't tell them you have to be smart to play chess, because, of course, we know it's not true. You have to be able to... Um, know certain things. You have to gain a certain knowledge of how the pieces move and that sort of thing, but then you're at square zero. You you don't know it enough to play a game. So you, you you learn a lot, and when they think that they can learn chess, then the math tables don't seem so hard. And that confidence that they gain is directly transferable back into the classroom. And so as an adult, it's a pleasant pastime. And in our elder ages, it's a solace. You know, when you're playing chess, you're not thinking about the next hospital appointment or your doctor's bill that you have to pay. You're playing chess. And it's, an, it's not just necessarily an escape, but what it is, is a universe of its own. And we have a universal language that we call chess. So it doesn't matter what language you speak or where you're from. You can know how to play chess. You can play chess with anyone. So I also want to congratulate you guys on not only on the Sanford, which is a, an example of estate planning. Um, it, it gives our, the best players a chance to um, study and maybe get coaching and other things so that they compete at the very highest levels, the elite players. But your outreach efforts to those in need, those people in what we call Title I schools in the United States, where they don't have the money to start a chess program, you guys provide them just sets and boards. Is that not true? And, yes. and uh, I'm sorry, yeah. And one, one of our, our key pushes uh, this year in the year of COVID is also to uh, supply the kids who, who can't afford it, the kids you're talking about, with U.S. chess memberships. As a matter of fact, uh, that's very important to get the word out right now because, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, um, um, if we give, uh, if our donors through us give, uh, these kids, uh, U.S. chess membership, it's a year of activity. It's a year of activity backing up uh, all, all the benefits that you just outlined. 
uh, and they can and people can and we want to encourage coaches and parents and teachers to contact us about those kids at need in need those at risk kids um, you know who need that small amount but important uh, uh, access uh, to organized chess. Yeah, I remember some great stories over the years of uh, you know, of parents and coaches and teachers that reached out to us from very poor areas of the United States, uh, and they were just looking for some help. And you know, it you know it could be small help. It was maybe some memberships, a demo board, chess sets, pieces. Uh, you know. Over the years, there's been a variety of things that we've supplied to schools nationwide as need was there and as resources permitted. But at a minimum, we try and get chess sets and board. And it's a great program, and it's had some tremendous success in decades, in decades that we've been doing that, uh, and, you know, in some of our most at-risk areas in the United States. And, and you know, sometimes this chess at the top, and uh, this help for uh, players who uh, need a little help um, overlap. I can tell you that uh, in the in in the Sanford program, Wesley So, I think we know who he is, top ten player, U.S. Uh, ch uh, champion, so forth, um, top top candidate in chess. He's often told me that when he received the Sanford stipend, the Stanford fellowship. Uh, that's what kept him in chess. He he was actually deciding to drop out of chess until he received that fellowship. So sometimes they overlap. Yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And he's very sincere about that. So um, when I, you guys are doing this from your homes, you're um, putting your time and energy into it. You're not getting paid to do it. You know, is it something like seeing a Wesley So keeping chess that makes you do it? What makes you guys do this work? Well, I, can, you know, I can start. I, you know, I started as a twelve-year-old kid, uh, you know, playing chess. Uh, ten, ten years ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was about that. Al, thanks. And and you know, I went to the local chess club, and I, you know, started a lifelong, um, you know, love affair with chess. And, and uh, you know, I've played my entire life. Uh, but, you know, chess, and we used to have a program that uh, was titled Chess Makes You Smart. I believe that chess helped complete uh, my thinking ability, uh, and that helped me in my career. Uh, you know, I was, you know, a top executive at a Fortune 50 company uh, and, and, you know, had success way beyond my expectations for myself. Uh, you know, I started at a small little county college and I ended up, uh, and my last college was Yale. Uh, and all of those things just don't happen to a kid from, f from a very, uh, you know, modest beginning, uh, you know, that you can achieve that. And I credit chess to much of my business success. And I feel this is a way to give back, uh, you know, just encouraging others and kids to be able to play, uh, you know, helping those in need in all the different categories that we have, whether it's, you know, supporting our top players, helping kids of all ages in all parts of the country, giving those chess sets back. We also are involved in prison chess, women's chess. We help seniors. You know, chess staves off Alzheimer's. That's how I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to keep playing chess so that I can keep my wits as I age. You know, that frost on my head doesn't stop the fire in my belly from being ever so strong about chess and chess promotion. So that's, you know, that's my reason to participate and to serve. Outstanding, Steve. You know, one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet also is the um, uh, World Chess Hall of Fame. Um, the, uh, the U.S. Chess Trust is uh, a partner in that and has supported it uh, since its uh, beginnings. Uh, and Steve is the one um, I remember very well, I was working for the U.S. Chess Federation and Steve became president and this new young guy came in and he had about, you know, 10 programs that we we're going to concentrate on and we we're going to, by God, get them done while he was president. And, and one of the things was the uh, U.S. Chess uh, Hall of Fame um, and Museum. And look at what it's become just this year. 
just this year. Uh, no, I'm sorry, since its beginning in St. Louis, uh, which is now its permanent home, um, they've had 115,000 and counting visitors since their opening there. And um, uh, they're always opening new digs and new programs. So that's something that introduces chess to a lot of people, uh, young and old, uh, which is right up our, our the alley of our mission. Well, Al, when I was starting chess, it wasn't very popular. Now you're talking about, you know, all these people going to visit the Hall of Fame. You know, but is chess becoming more popular? Is there something that's going on that might be a reason for that or helping that become more popular? Can you think Let's about see. Let's see. I think there's something on Netflix, isn't there? Oh. Yeah. Netflix. What's that, Steve? What What's on Netflix? Well, there's a great story that was written by Walter Tevis, who also wrote The Hustler. Uh, that was one of his classics, The Color of Money and a Man Who Fell to Earth. Uh, and, and, you know, and it's really the story, as you know, as I heard directly from him, it's a combination of two interesting players. One was Lisa Lane, who was a top player in the 1960s. And that was really the model for the character with a little bit of Bobby Fischer thrown in to provide some of the eccentricness. You know, Bobby was a bit clueless in many ways as to uh, he really had a function day to day, really a chess player, but a little off in terms of how to manage, uh, you know, uh, the more mundane things, shall we say. Of life. Oh, nice and, yes. And this character is the perfect blend of that in a terrific storyline. And it's really one of the few movies I've ever watched. Of course, it's a series, but it's one of the few things that are just chessically perfect. The pieces, the chess clocks, even the language that's used. And, of course, uh, Bruce Pandolfini and Gary Kasparov himself were, uh, you know, consulting on that. And it's obvious. It really has a great touch. Yeah. And it's a great plot. It's a great plot and storyline for anybody and all of my friends who only casually play attention to chess yeah. because of me have watched it and have really enjoyed it. So right. uh, it's it's really a good thing. But there's been a number of chess movies out recently uh, in the last several years. They had a, there was one about the Bobby Fischer match against Spassky uh, that had top stars. You like Tobey Maguire was in that. There's been a number of others that have been out. Uh, and, and so chess has become mainstream and it gives everybody something to do in these COVID days to play chess online. Uh, and, and a lot of our biggest, most successful in-person tournaments are moving to online also uh, so that keeping chess alive, which is so important for all of us. And it's a good, healthy way to be able to participate and to still enjoy so many benefits that chess has to offer until we can all see each other again face to face. Yes. And Steve, don't you have something to do with a big tournament? I don't know. It's around February or something like that. Yes. Yes, Jim. It's, you know, uh, every year, the World Amateur Team Championship, uh, which is uh, the largest open chess tournament in the United States and the largest team tournament in the entire world, wow. takes place in New Jersey. Uh, but this year, we're going to be online. And, and it's going to be uh, you know, the first time that we've ever been online. Uh, and it's going to be on President's Day weekend. The New Jersey Chess Federation, which is the oldest chess federation in the country, started... Uh, always holding a chess event on President's Day weekend. And really, it was encouraged by William Steinitz, who lived in New Jersey, who was world chess champion. And in 1885, he held the first event on President's Day weekend in the state of New Jersey. I didn't and, know that. And we have continued holding chess events on President's Day weekend. It was then Washington's birthday weekend ever yes. since. And the team tournament has, it. it's a Jersey tradition and, you know, and all of the means that uh, you could imagine from Taylor Ham to uh, great bagels and, and great chess and seeing old friends. Uh, but, it, you know, it is a Jersey tradition and we're going to hold it online this year. But it's not just Jersey, because I know some people from California who have played in that event. Yo, well, yeah, and we've uh, all over the world. All over the place. We've had teams from China. Yeah. We've had teams from Canada. We've had teams from the Middle East and South America. Not many international teams have come because New Jersey is not exactly what you'd call a winter destination. But, <laughs> but for chess, it is the destination. And we've had visits from world champions. 
We had all three Polger sisters come one year. We had Anatoly Karpov play in his first tournament ever in the United States that he participated in. Uh, and we had Gary Kasparov just a few years come and visit us uh, and talk to all the players. So we've uh, you think we've it managed was- to get just about every U.S. Grandmaster over the years to play as well. So it's been pretty good. You think by going online, you might even expand the reach? I don't know. I'm hopeful. My goal is to just provide a you know, a place for people to be able to come on President's Day weekend so that they don't forget about it until yeah. we can be back live and in person, hopefully in 2022. But in 2021, we've got a placeholder out there. And I hope everybody comes and joins us because I'm already starting to write my jokes for the weekend so that I can make people laugh. Uh-huh. Uh, and, 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 and I hope to see everybody there play. Yeah, because, you know, I... Obviously, I'm older than you are, but um, I think that, you know, I grew up playing face-to-face over the board competition, and this online chess is um, harder for me because, you know, you can't tell if your move surprised your opponent or not, which you can do in over-the-board chess. But, you know, I'm not the guy you're reaching out for now. These kids growing up today, they're all over the online chess. I think it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful world. Well, well, one of the um, benefits of this terrible challenge that we're all going through is that uh, we're improving online chess so much. So it's it's not uh, now uh, normally uh, true in a, a national tournament that you won't see your opponent. You know, you're actually seeing your opponent in many of the tournaments. Uh, and you can even see other people who play. Uh, I don't know how Steve is going to uh, uh, manage uh, the huge event online. That's going to be, what, the biggest online event of all time, probably? Probably got a challenge. I'm hoping, I'm hoping yeah. and we've got some logistical issues we're going to work through, and we're going to work through them successfully. We've got a great partner with the Internet Chess Club. ICC yes. is going to be our site. The advertising will all be out in the next 30 days. You can get information on it now at, you know, at njscf.org. Uh, but we're going to really do our very best. We're going to have some online rooms with some top commentators. Uh, we're going to have our usual special awards for the best chess name. And we've had some great ones over the years. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we're going to have our chess gimmick prizes. But most of all, we're going to have chess with friends and great chess and competitive chess. And, you know, and that'll be a lot of fun. And Jim, I think you could play easily from California and get your own team. Always working me, Steve. <laughs> That's right. And you can even wear that hat. Oh, and you're saying that I could actually see my opponent. You're going to be able to see lots of things. You're going to be able to see me. You're going to be able to see other you know, matches. All the matches will be available to view so you could see Harvard versus Yale, as an example, and see the four boards. That's going to be what's going to be a little more unique right. about our site here and the way we're going to be setting this up so that you'll be able to watch the matches and see them all in one place. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that is one of the things that we're going to put in place for this event. That is another advantage because, you know, I, I can tell by personal experience that people don't like you hovering over their board when it's in person, you know, so you can't really see what's going on unless there's a demo board or something like that. But the online presentation of the boards, you can follow everything without being. In- yeah, no, I, I think that's a great example. I mean, I remember uh, you know, we had this guy called Sammy Ryshevsky that played in the tournament back in the day. He uh-huh. used to wear a hat very similar to yours, in fact. And, yeah. and you know, yeah, and Jim, everybody used to hover over his board. You'd see all of a sudden you'd look into the ballroom and I'd see a hundred people around one table. And I'm like, what's going on? And of course I'd get in there and I'd push my way in. I'm pretty good at that. You know, big guy, you know, I would push my way in. And the next thing I know, I see this little tiny guy sitting on the board with that little signature hat of his. And you realize that's Sammy Ryshevsky, one of the greatest players of all time. And of course, everybody wants to watch him. And he played every year until really the end of his days. And that was a wonderful thing to have him. But he played on just a regular board, just like everybody else. We didn't set him apart. Uh, right. And, and he didn't mind. And in fact, I'll even tell you a little story. I remember one time the player that he was playing, well, I'll say he was a little rude to Sammy. I guess he told Sammy that 
you know, I guess Sammy adjusted a piece and didn't say it just loud enough. And so Sammy kind of looked at him and, and for the rest of the game, Sammy did not look at the board, but he moved instantaneously. He looked at the player he, and he moved the piece instantaneously and hit his clock and, and never studied the board the rest of the game and just glared at the opponent. And of course, <laughs> that young man was a 2300 player and he lost. And yeah. Sammy just enjoyed that last uh, you know, gift of strength that, uh, that he had. Yeah, well, Steve, you know, I don't know about you, but Al and I are used to people hovering over our boards watching us play. And uh, it can be a little tough, you know, because, you know, you're trying to concentrate and there's massive pe people around you that uh, can interfere with your concentration. Uh, most, and especially when, around my board when they begin to laugh after yes, I move. That, that really that, gets yes, to me. That, that's distracting. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, you guys, I want to say I, my, I have to tip my hat to you guys um, because what you're doing is making a difference. And even if it's a small incremental improvement in society, it is that. It's an improvement in society. Because when you introduce chess into the school system, kids learn chess, you change lives. People gain confidence. Their self-esteem rises. And that's directly transferable into whatever they do, into their classrooms and as Steve pointed out, into your careers. It can be a business career. It can be whatever you want. And we'd love you to become a grandmaster, but we don't actually care if you become a grandmaster. If you take this out into the world and use it to make yourself better and those around you better and society just a little bit better, then it's a gift that, gifts, that lasts a lifetime and it helps. You know, so and, I congratulate you guys. Well, I appreciate it. And, you know, you you talked about philanthropy, at least you, you know, a general philanthropy. Uh, I think that's the one thing that's truly a win-win in our society. You help someone and you feel good about it. Yeah. And, you know, what, 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 what is really better than that? There's, there's a few things in life better, but that, that's one that uh, can be easily done and you can feel good about it all year. When you when you help someone, and the other thing is, you're giving and helping someone, and you're not expecting anything in return. You know, and that's a marvelous feeling. You know, if you give something and expect something back, you know, that's a transaction. But you guys, that's what defines charity to me, philanthropy to me, is that you're giving freely, without expectations of a return. You're just and I, and, our, and I'm talking about our contributors who can feel good because they know their their contribution is really helping people. And that's really a you know a you know a huge plus for everybody to think about uh, that it's a gift of a lifetime and you're changing people's lives and, and and I can't stress enough how important that is. That's the one thing that we can do as people that that gift transcends our own lives and lasts forever. And, 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 and helping kids learn how to play chess, starting them off on the road to chess will only help them in so many aspects of their own lives that you're really creating, you know, you're building up society. It may sound like a, you know, oh boy, that's a grandiose statement, but really it's not because by see, starting them off early, it helps their brain grow. And there's and we, no, there's, there's no doubt that that's true. We uh, see it all the time. Absolutely. We see it all the time. So, example after example. Yes. I mean, you can get that information at www.uschesstrust.org, and you know, just go there, and you know, and you can uh, make donations off of that site and follow the uh, the prompts there, and it's a great way to do it. And 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 Jim, I just like to thank you for one this outreach. You know, to us, to you know, just give us a little bit of time to be able to talk about chess, to be able to talk about the chess trust, to share a few stories of our our mutual love of this game, yeah. and, and you know, and why it's important to us and really to the whole country. Uh, and you know, I just like to recognize Al too. Al, you know, Al is our our part time, full time guy. Yeah, he's he deals with the public every day, uh, yeah. and we're so lucky to have him and his and his wonderful partner Daff, uh, who helps him be successful for us uh, and, and uh, you know, really couldn't ask for a better executive director, 
managing director for our Arches Trust, uh, and, and we're very fortunate to have him. But thank you both for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thank you both. And I encourage all our viewers, hi, Mom, to go to the trust site and check it out um, and see if you and I wouldn't have thought to have a U.S. Chess Trust uh, behind us. You know, so Al thinks of these things and we don't. And <laughs> so we got to you know, give, him, give him his props, even though we'll, as soon as the show is over, we'll start teasing him again. Oh, ridicule. Nothing but ridicule. For yes. <laughs> that's, that's the bond. <laughs> 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 but thank you both for being on the show. Great, great really, to see you guys. It's great to always see you. And, you know, especially in these times, it's, it's really feels like we have a connection. And uh, so uh, thank you very much again. And I'm going to take you guys backstage. And I want to say my little goodbyes to our massive viewing audience. Many thanks. So, goodbye, John. Al. Goodbye, Steve. And it's just Jim E now. It's James E, but you can call me Jim. And this has been The Chess Files. The answers are out there. And I want you all to know that every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we will be bringing you another question. And the answers are out there. So thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you next week.